one and we're recording so we're live how are you sue i'm good so happy to be here today getting to chat with you yeah likewise um so i was going to say actually you know what um monday is an interesting day but uh you know in bitcoin it's kind of like every day is all uh, you know kind of meshed into one but just curious how's your uh, how was your weekend <laughs> Weekend was pretty good. Um, yeah. I agree with what you're saying. I feel like one year in Bitcoin feels like 10 years in literally every other industry. Obviously, Bitcoin never sleeps. Um, weekend was good. Took us forever to connect because I was recovering from having appendicitis. Oh. After what I thought was too many beans on Taco Tuesday was actually needing my appendix out. So, um, yeah, good. Just laying low and glad to be here. Cool. Okay. Wow. So you're, you're quite the trooper then you're, uh, you had, you had this and then now you're already on podcast. So I appreciate that. Um, well, okay. So I usually start with where did we first meet? Do you even remember? It must've been somewhere in Toronto, like a meetup or was it at one of the events? No, I think it was when I first got hired at Shift. As you know, I'm senior vice president of global partnerships at Shift Network. And I believe you came in to the office and Joe introduced you as sort of one of the OGs in the game, founder of Uno Coin, which is amazing. Um, and I think that was about two years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems about right. I'm trying to think if, if I think, I think it might've been before that actually, um, you, I think you spoke at one of my events at the Sheraton, no? Oh yes, I did. Yeah. It was on a panel, the Sheraton. This is like early days, right? Yeah. Yeah. 20k like november 2017 oh my god i completely forgot about that i was on a panel with kraken coinberry that's the one that's the one i remember that one that was like such an entertaining panel um yeah, yeah. Uh, the audience was what i thought was the most entertaining like what do you mean some, well there were just some like obviously very astute investors but also a couple guys who were dressed like snoop dogg and people who had clearly made some serious cash early <laughs> on like wearing like emblems and shit um oops sorry i swore but uh that's oh, all good yeah no yeah that was that was right before bitcoin hit 20k i remember end of november mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so so i guess like what what does um like your bitcoin story look like but you know before that even like what is your story are you are you from around here are you from toronto or yeah, I'm from Toronto, grew up in Toronto, um, and my background actually is in financial services and capital markets. Mm. So before getting on the Bitcoin blockchain bandwagon, um, I was in institutional sales on the retail side um, to, to small institutions, selling structured product at a company called Invesco. Um, and the reason why I left financial services in 2016 was because effectively I realized I was way too young to be this dead inside every Monday morning <laughs> and working okay. in this environment of like information silos, prehistoric processes, old white haired dudes, you know, who had no idea literally about any technology or anything, just doing the same thing day in, day out like an innovation graveyard. Mm. I, I was just, I was just like, I am way too young to be this frustrated about like effectively what is upholding the financial services ecosystem, like the underlying structures and the archaic processes driving trading, driving systems, driving identity systems um, in Canada. And that's when I decided, you know, started doing my research, learned about um, blockchain, started to learn about Bitcoin, um, and yeah, in 2016, decided that like that was the move, and that's what I wanted to get into. And yeah, haven't haven't really looked back since then. So so uh, so that's that's interesting because I, I kind of cite a similar type of um, you know angst or I don't know weird feeling about the financial industry that I you know kind of felt like something was wrong. I couldn't quite articulate maybe what it was at the time, but I felt like there was definitely, we could do a lot better, but just curious, what's, what was your kind of, you know, what, if you had to like sum it up in a couple of key points, like what, what was it mainly about the traditional financial system that didn't seem right? So, so how trades actually went through was, mm. was like crazy making to me and made no sense whatsoever. You have to wait three days for trades to settle. It's done by a human in a back office where 
one third of the time something goes wrong, something's manually entered incorrectly. You have hun sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars at stake, or that can be potentially entered wrong. And then effectively as a salesperson, it was then on us to deal with the client when our back office had screwed up, but that's not even me, you know, hating on sort of some of the back office processes that no one was empowered, at least where I was. Um, and in the section of capital markets that I was in, no one had the technology to empower them or to give them any agency to do better. Um, and also, of course, I mean, I don't know if you're going to put this in your podcast, but you just had these old white guys who had been there for 30 plus years getting all their business done on the golf course, you know, very low encouragement for innovation. I remember even once I got in trouble because I tried to turn the sick room into a meditation nook. Huge trouble for that. Like it was, it was just a very like stifling, suffocating um, industry. And, you know, I just, I knew that there was more out there and more potential. And I just wanted to be a part of those drivers of change and not just sort of like the apathetic, we do it this way because we've always done it this way type of attitude. So, yeah. And when, and when you said like Bitcoin or was it blockchain um, that, that kind of caught your interest, what was it about the space? Like, what was it about it? Like, did you read an article? Was it like a sequence of events? Was it like a, you know what I mean? Like, what so, was it that eventually so made you go, okay, wait, there's, because I mean, most people at face value think of it as like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not the most maybe well, now it's becoming, oh, PayPal is accepting it yeah. and this and that or whatever they're doing. But 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 back then, I assume, you know, like, how did you get a, like, what? Well, yeah, what was it about this technology that, you know, so intrigued you? I kind of have a different I kind of I have a similar story a little bit to Joe. Um, so Joe, our founder mm. of GIF Network and founder of Paycase, um, in the sense that I went and did a jungle survival course for a couple of weeks in um, the Amazon Guyana. So it was me and like four other dudes in the jungle, basically learning how to, how like jungle survival skills. And it was me and this trauma, two trauma therapists. And then this dude who was a logistics engineer for Doctors Without Borders. And then it was led by this former special British forces officer. Um, and he actually did all the stunt training for um, Channing Tatum in some of Channing Tatum's like action movies where he's been in the jungle. Anyways, so it was five of us in the jungle for two weeks. And we had these villagers from a small village in the Amazon who basically followed us around because there's so many freaking ways to die, especially if you're like a, you know, white chick from Toronto who doesn't know like if it's March or Tuesday, let alone like how to like build a fire. So anyways, we had these villagers follow us around, keep us safe from animals, keep me away from like murder ant nests and all sorts of shit. How they got paid though was through Bitcoin. So there was about six of them, six of these villagers who followed us around. None of them knew when their birthdays were. None of them had any form of identification. All of them had cell phones and how they got paid for our services was through Bitcoin. So, and that was in late 2016 that I did that. And um, that was sort of the tipping point to me, you know, like I had read up a lot on distributed ledger and, you know, how, how, the actual technology itself and how it could reduce where, where was that in, in the Amazon as well? You said yeah, in, in Amazon Guyana. And so they the were Amazon actually, hits, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah I know what you mean. Four different countries, and it was the Guy, Guy, like Guyana Amazon. Um, and they so, were actually using Bitcoin, you said? Yeah, yeah. They're like their head chief had um, that, that's how they got paid in Bitcoin. Okay, so interesting. Okay, so, uh, that's fascinating. <laughs> well, Joe, but Joseph's this, story this, wasn't around that. It was more like he saw Western Union and then he had the insight that Bitcoin could be. But you're saying your story was actually like seeing it being used in the Amazon. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Like, is there more to that or? <laughs> I mean, it was, it was just this one dude who, who basically. How did he learn about it? He didn't have a computer or was he told? They about all it? had cell phones. I actually, oh, to be honest phones. at the time, I didn't really go into it with him because he didn't really speak English, but. So there was a bit of like a like so a. So we had like a a blockchain wallet or like what? I think I I mean at the time <laughs> I didn't really ask to see, but he had a cell phone that and he awesome. said he got paid in Bitcoin, and so that that was sort of the tipping point for me. Like again, I had Whoa. done the research leaving finance, knew I want you know knew the strengths of decentralized systems and distributed ledgers, um, and what that could look like potentially in an open 
slash private permission space. But that was the tipping point for me in terms of how this could really bring in like the 1.8 billion people without any identity into the formal economy right, um, and right. give them some sort of agency. So, so yeah, that was, that was the tipping point for me for sure. Okay. So, and then what, and how do you go from being in the middle of the Amazon, uh, where you're this chief is like Bitcoin, you know, it's the, the next big thing to you being like, okay, I'm going to leave this like super respectable, like, you know, finding like you're working what I assume downtown Toronto or somewhere it is, right? Of course, like, like- Nine so like, to five, <laughs> like that, 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 that's, quite <laughs> that's quite you know a leap that's quite a leap yeah um well so so I left but it took me about a year to convince basically everyone in the blockchain and crypto space that I wasn't just another financial douchebag like hopping on board everyone it like so it literally was about a year of convincing people to hire me and that I actually could be of value even though I had zero startup experience and had effectively like no idea what it meant to help build a company. Um, but then Coin Square was launched in early, like mid 2017. And then I was one of their first hires and Cole, the CEO liked that I had um, like the trading and the financial services, capital markets background. Um, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. thought that would be a good compliment for um, helping run the wealth desk and the trading there um, at Coin Square. Interesting. So then what year are we in now? 2016? This is 2017. 2017. Okay. So now you've, uh, okay. So I, Amazon Forest, uh, you now you're in, you're in a company you've uh, been hired by at the time. I know CoinSquare was kind of like the only show in town to some extent yeah. um, that was reputable was, and, you know, yeah. and, that, and so curious. So what did that, what did that experience look like and feel like? So that was wild in the sense that it was like, momentum bitcoin craziness mardi gras i mean like you've been in the industry you know how it was cole literally had bankers coming in begging (laughs) to buy him lunch like he would do all of his meetings in the middle of the room so we could all listen in and they would just be kissing his butt throwing money like wanting to get in on this next infrastructure deal for bitcoin um i had random people calling me saying you know quadrico will accept bags of cash will you guys take bags of cash i can meet you at a coffee shop right now like just the craziest characters coming out of the woodwork once they heard that CoinSquare um, could offer and do some of the larger deals uh, that they could. Um, and then Bitcoin obviously hit 20,000 bucks and it was just wild. Like you had these little turds, I don't know how else to say it, these little 21 year old angry nerds playing in the corners of the internet who were now worth like hundreds of millions of dollars who had been mining Bitcoin since like 2011 at like 30 cents. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of egos, a lot of fun, a lot of partying. Um, consensus in New York in 2018. I mean, I was a shift at that time was wild. Um, I think the Financial Times wrote up a story on sort of one of the parties that shift through because it was a little bit offside and got a little mm. bit crazy. Um, but yeah, it was great. I've, I've never been you know, in a bull market like that in my life um, for anything. And I've never experienced that hysteria firsthand, but it was, it was a lot of fun. Interesting. Interesting. And okay. So, so now we're in 2018 or what is it? Yeah. Like, what was that big hype? 2017, 2018, right? Yeah. 2017. And then January, February, 2018. And then things went awry in March, 2018. Um, and that's when I was actually on a panel, uh, at brain station. And that's where I met Bruce, the CEO of shift network. And we hit it off and he told me he was expanding his team and, and effectively blockchain is actually what I wanted to be in. I didn't want to be hustling Bitcoin and selling crypto for the rest of my life. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, we hit it off. And then I joined the shift team working in the digital identity space in May of 2018. Interesting. Okay. So I guess what did, uh, and what, by the way, I do remember brain station. I, I spoke there, I think with Anthony one, uh, one time nice. before after you guys, but, uh, I kind of miss those times No, Like just being in a room with people, like you kind of took it for granted. I remember at one point it was like, Oh, another Bitcoin event. Now it's like, Oh, it'd be nice to be at a Bitcoin event. <laughs> you know what I would give to be able to go and like mingle and have random banter. Like I, mi- I miss it so much. Yeah. Um, mm. And I'm so sad that like consensus is off and futurist is off and it's obviously not the same doing it online, but yeah, I can't mm. wait for it to go back to normal. Yeah, I got to admit, I miss it too. Um, 
Yeah. You know, sometimes they say like, like you don't really realize how important something is until it's kind of like taken it away from you, you know? And so I think, I think when events do come back, they'll come, come roaring back and they'll be like a big deal. <laughs> oh, especially uh, the parties afterwards, people are going to be like throwing their back out on the dance floor. I already know what pair of shoes I plan on wearing when I like, yeah. when I break my leg dancing so hard. So yeah. <laughs> and we have like the best, right? Uh, like Toronto has like the, like one of the best kind of, party seeds and all that too right and then you mix that with bitcoin i remember every event i threw like afterwards it was just like epic <laughs> and <laughs> one of the things fun to be so had. great about toronto too is we've got some serious bitcoin ogs here right, right, right. like like vitalik and um anthony and there's it's mm-hmm. so i find the bitcoin og party scene is is really awesome because you have people who are truly actually driving change, not just the bandwagoners like me. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Okay. So where does your bandwagon take you next? <laughs> oh, oh, I think I lost you. Hold on. No, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Okay. No, I was going to say where, so you said you met Bruce. So then, uh, so what, what does Bruce, uh, so what is it about Bruce? Cause you did mention identity earlier on as well. So just yeah. curious, like, what was it about kind of the blockchain, Bitcoin? Well, I guess not wanting to sell it anymore, but having seen kind of the frenzy. And, yeah. And then what, what, like, how did you kind of you know, come to the next decision or the next part of your career? Yeah. Well, I liked the idea that um, shift was trying to solve for identity and specifically how do you solve for identity between the old and new ways and paradigms of doing business like how do you how do you marry these traditional legacy systems and services with these new paradigms and strength of decentralized systems to bring on board you know either marginalized populations or create different use cases um and effectively act as that bridge i liked and i thought that shift of all the projects out there were were sort of we're doing it the right way um and also again like like what a powerhouse team i mean bruce is a is a proven entrepreneur has like so, built and sold something like 23 businesses joe's an og um has been in the space since 2009 chris forrester is one of the like is not even from this planet like she's one of the smartest people i've ever met in my life so so the opportunity to join a team of such like a motley crew of like these crazy brains and uh, was like a huge for sure it was awesome yeah. So yeah, yeah. It, it, very interesting. So curious though. So maybe, maybe like kind of dig into why identity might be important because I, I'm not going to lie. Like my gut reaction towards like the word identity as like, let's say someone who's been in the Bitcoin space for a long time is usually that, you know, the only thing I don't care about identity is, is like preserving it. Right. And, yeah. Uh, and so, so why, why is identity even important on the kind of the grander scheme? And, and, and then, yeah. And then, I mean, we'll kind of back into, I guess, some of the applications, but curious to know from your perspective, like why, yeah, yeah why is like, what's wrong with the way it's done now? Um, you know, well, and, and yeah. So I, so I wonder just before I get into that, yeah. is one of the reasons why maybe you're not, or why identity if I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're a bit like reticent in terms of how important identity is in, in the space. I'm just trying to give, well, sorry, I'm trying to give you my kind of gut reaction to the, my initial reaction. Whenever I, the word identity comes up, it's usually, it's like, okay, well, well, you know, usually it's like, when you think about it, it's like, well, government identity. So it's about like identifying me and identifying where I am. But it's like, I, I know where I am and what I need to do. So my, my first reaction is why, why do, why is it important to even be thinking about identity and, uh, and how does that relate to like the world around me? And you know what yeah. I'm saying? It's kind of like a general, like holistic question, but like, I get it. And as an entrepreneur, obviously, as you know, even a business owner, we, we have been doing KYC since 20, you know, 13. Right. Um, yeah. but, but still like, you know, sometimes we just do things. Right. And so I don't know, we, we don't kind of always question like fundamentally what we're doing or why. And, but I'm just curious to know what, why is identity important to you? Yeah. Well, I think it's especially interesting when you're talking about identity in the Bitcoin and digital asset space, because one of the fundamental pillars behind Bitcoin is, is privacy, right? Like the right to transact privately without 
any intermediaries and the, like the right to have your own agency and control over, over your identity and who knows who you are. Um, but so I think the reason though why it's so interesting in the digital asset space inside of things is the fact that like, look, traditional banks, the traditional banking system is not going to go away. Um, and in order for our ecosystem and the strength of it to survive, there has to be a way for counterparty discovery so that those traditional institutions feel comfortable, like e even, you know, the PayPal's and the Shopify's of the world feel comfortable transacting um, or being able to do discovery and some due diligence as to, who the, you know, what party they're transacting with. Like, so in order for our ecosystem to thrive and truly interoperate with the traditional world, there has to be a way to satisfy the KYC and KYB rules. Um, and especially one of the use cases that Shift is working on right now that, that um, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with is the FATF travel rule. So, so that that is pretty like, that's like the wildest, um, one of the wildest regulations that's come down the pipeline in terms of basically regulators came down and said, okay, before any transaction can happen, you have to exchange identity you have to do a KYC and exchange and transfer identity before any transactions can happen. So, and as you know, the problem with that is there's 10,000 vast virtual asset service providers in the world. Um, as an end consumer, I don't have any guarantee as to where my identity is going, what's happening with it, and how is it going to be stored. So effectively, but in order to stay on the right side of these regulations, that has to happen. So Shift has created an infrastructure that solves for that. Um, and I mean, this is sort of a long-winded response, but yeah, I mean, in order for this system and the innovation to continue to thrive, there, you know, we have to find ways to interoperate with the traditional world and and regulators. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I'm trying, you know, I, I, so I haven't had my conversation with Joseph yet around shift. We did like a whole hour and a half, but it was, I think we got to like 2015 or something and stopped um, just because there was so much there, oh, but yeah, I'm going to, I'm still due to, to sit down with him and, and, you know, and he kind of touched on some of the ideas and just some of my private conversations with him around like sovereignty and the yeah. importance of kind of like owning your identity like right now um i think we a lot a lot of people like i mean most of the people out there probably don't even care that much about like their identity because they're all out in social yeah. media like it's kind of like um <clears throat> but there is like you know this like thing around <clears throat> just like our identity being taken by these companies and like using it to advertise to us or whatever, whatever, versus a world where we kind of own the rights to our identity and the ability to kind of monetize it. And mo well, what, yeah, if, I mean, if that's so what we choose to do in a certain, you know, relationship yeah. or partnership, then so be it if whatever it is, but like uh, have more control of kind of like uh, my identity, if you, if you know what I mean. And so, so I wonder if, if any of that kind of feeds in uh, to the shift narrative, right? Like, I'm just trying to yeah. I, like I get the fat of thing. And by the way, I want to, I want to spend some time on that because I think that's a bit of a, um, you know, a bit of a concern, right? Like, I think a lot of people in the community are bringing up, like, one of my favorite things to do is to call out pink elephants, right? Like, the last yeah. thing I want to do is, like, dance around ideas or, or topics that people are thinking about and not even address them, right? And so, so I, and, and by the way, I, I'm well aware of kind of the, the regulatory framework. But if I had to summarize what you said earlier in terms of like, what is the number, like what is the reason for doing identity? Uh, I mean, primarily from a, from like a very pragmatic and business perspective, it's to get banking. It's to do yeah. banking. It's to, yeah. and I, maybe I would even go a little bit further and, and, and say that it's about getting banking, but it's also about interfacing with, um, government government like you know and, and by the way whether one believes in government or not is yeah. kind of secondary the fact that they exist and they're a very real part of our world is something that i think all of us you know recognize right and so so in interfacing with government um you know what i mean like like it's important that like so as an example like law enforcement right if somebody yeah. is doing something nefarious on your platform um and, and, and forget like marginally weird things. Let's just take it to the far extreme where somebody's doing something really, really bad, like that everybody universally would agree that is negative. How do you work with local law enforcement to maybe not have that happen again, right? If you have no clue as to, 
you know, what's happening on your platform. So things, things like that. Oh, hey, Susanna. No, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Keep going. Don't lose your train of thought. That was good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Are you kind of picking up what I'm putting down here though? In, in the yeah. sense that like, like, it, like I agree that there's like on a personal note, I, I love things like Uniswap and, you know, these exchanges where there's like completely, yeah. and I think that is the final and holy grail, right? Of like, you know, like decentralized exchanges. It's, and I think we should get to that as well. Sorry, I'm just going on a rant, but feel free to butt in at any point. Well, well I think what's, I'm, I'm what's just, yeah. interesting is I actually heard our, a stat the other day and this maybe isn't so much with respect to identity, but with how s s open and private permission systems can be optimized or how government can be optimized by leveraging the strength of these systems and different ways of sharing identity than how they're doing right now. Um, I heard this stat the other day that apparently even in Canada alone, the fact that that um, ministries in between provinces can't properly share identity with each other because they're they're basically being held hostage by legacy by legacy systems closed systems that actually has impacted our ability to produce g our like our gdp by about four percent hmm. just because even as a country in between provinces there's no effective way to share that you know who this business is or who this customer is and that's basically cost us 4% of our total GDP. 4% mm. may not seem like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, it is, it is when it, in it, oh, when it can, yeah. right? 4% of it, GDP it, is a huge amount. Um, but I was queer. So, okay. So, okay. So, okay. Um, so I guess it's like a spectrum, right? There's like certain things, like for example, your cold storage for your crypto or something yeah. or whatever, you might want to be very like anonymous and private about it, right? Yeah. But there are certain circumstances where you might want to um, interact with, you know, it might be like, you know, an exchange like CoinSquare, like you mentioned, or yeah. Coinbase, or, you know, where you don't want to meet somebody in physical person <laughs> and do like a cash transaction. And, and in case you do need to rely on the money in your bank, there are a lot of people who bank, have bank accounts. That is the predominant way people, you know, uh, you know, kind of transact today. So, so we could, we can at least agree that there is a need or, you know, in all of our, or most of our lives where we do need to have identity. Now we can also probably agree that the way identity is done today is like, I'm talking not blockchain, blah, blah, blah. I'm talking like the way identity is being done today is messed up. Like, yeah, big cool stop. Like, look at TransUnion or whatever, like all these Equifax hacks you talk about. You know, it is just bizarre, right? Like, how well, many, like identity well, thefts and hacks there are. So, I'm just saying, is like it needs to be re reimagined, if you will. Like, I see a big so the, cra the craziest thing, just, just on that note. So, I remember mm -hmm. like about a year ago, I wanted to open a self directed RSP at CIBC. Uh -huh. I had been at CIBC for 10 years paid back loans with them, used all sorts of different of structured product with them and whatnot. But in order for me, after them knowing me for 10 years, I still, when I wanted to open a self-directed RSP, had to hand over my driver's license, hand over, you know, another piece of where my address is. They took a photocopy, put it somewhere else in a silo in their, in their organization. And that's messed up. Like the amount of multinational enterprises that hold people's identities in all these different little silos, AKA points of hackable interfaces for people with, you know, wanting to do nefarious activity or steal identity is, is wild. And that's where I think, you know, for example, the shift network infrastructure, how we're structured is we're like an attestation framework. So instead of, you know, constantly having to have your copies of your ID held in different silos, you can instead have a public ledger that says, okay, you know, as an auditor or as an end consumer, I can, you know, see who has my identity and where is it being held. And if someone else wants it, they can obtain it through a private um, side chain, or they can just go by that attestation and say, okay, if I need this identity information, there's a way that I, I know exactly where to find it without having to keep it and store it myself. Um, so sorry, that was, didn't mean to interrupt you there, but I, I just, I agree with what you're saying. It's messed how we do it today. It's messed up. So, I mean, like identity does need to be kind of rethought of where, whether it's, like I said, whether it's like companies like Facebook and whatnot, kind of leveraging it to their purpose and advertising yeah. to us and monetizing it, 
or whether it be like governments or whether it be like, uh, you know, these, like, I mean, you can just go on and on and on. Right. So yeah. identity obviously is not working if you will. Um, and so, so now kind of talk to me a bit and even, and I do want to spend time on FATF and all that. Right. But I, I want to like, kind of understand um, because like, quite frankly, like, uh, yeah, like I'm, I'm very curious. I'm very curious. Like in terms of the early days of like, as this thesis for shift was, was formulating and, you know, shift has obviously like gone on to partner now with Binance and a lot yeah. of the large exchanges around the world to, to kind of help them, um, you know, uh, address a lot of the concerns around FATF regulatory framework. But, but before that, like just, so what is kind of shifts, I guess, overall mission, if you will. And, you know, like, I mean, not to put you on the spot, but like, what is kind of the yeah. overarching goal? Um, and, and from what I understand, this application towards FATF is really just one. Um, yeah. But, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think, you know, there's a couple of different use cases for our infrastructure, but effectively we're, we're very passionate about creating new frameworks for creditability and for reputation and how that's disseminated and shared. So be it, you know, if you're a Canadian government looking to optimize how you share information right now, or if you're finance wanting to stay on the right side of regulation, that's great. But we also work with governments like the government of Bermuda who wants to create an electronic identification passportization system. So our infrastructure is going to be used to support that. Um, last year, we had quite a few conversations with some organizations on the ground in Uganda and potentially um, bringing on and creating a capital markets like um, uh, ecosystem for farmers who wanted to trade goods like corn and wheat and basically like an agricultural market system where they're currently not able to participate in the formal economy because again, none of these farmers have identity. Like there's a whole swath of, um, I, I, want, I want to say almost millions of um, people producing in the agricultural sector in Uganda who aren't able to formally participate because they don't have the identity to transact in financial services or, um, you know, make any calls when it comes to, you know, hedging with respect to their wheat and that sort of thing. Um, but we were going to, yeah, use our infrastructure so that, you know, instead of, you know, someone coming up with an identity, coming up with a passport and saying, hey, you know, here's my wheat to sell, you could have a shop peaker, keeper who provides an attestation that says, bang, yes, you may not know who this guy is, but I know that every week this farmer provides me with three quality bushels of hay or, you know, 12 quality bags of corn. And so I can attest on behalf of this producer that his goods are good and that, you know, subsequently, if he wants to get a loan, I can attest that this guy's good to deliver X, Y, Z amount of corn or wheat weekly. So sorry, that was a bit of a wine, like a long winded answer there. But but those are the different types of you know, fringe use cases. And effectively, we wanna be able to bring the 1.8 billion people without identity in the world right now into the formal financial services sector through partnerships and through different initiatives and through you know, our, the different use cases our infrastructure can support. Okay, so so I guess one thing might be worthwhile doing is defining what it is. So what what is uh, shift? I guess this 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 you know project and um, yeah, and kind of what's the story behind it in terms of yeah. Yeah, so shift is an open source blockchain protocol designed to create compliant asset routing structures. So you can kind of look at us as like a Swift like entity uh, for identity and identity uh -huh. transfer. Um, and we also function like an attestation highway. So, um, yeah, like attestations that are open and auditable and anyone can figure out who has vouched for who with respect to KYC, KYB, and knowing, you know, who your counterparty is. Okay. So, so now, now maybe I talk a little bit about, um, the, let's talk a little bit about FATF. Like, first of all, you know, what, what the hell is it? Uh, why should people care? You know, how does it, how does it affect, you know, everyone? Yeah. So the financial action task force is effectively the global um, governing body for financial services. And if you're not on the right side of their rules, you effectively get shut down, potentially fined, um, 
So it's in every organization who is governed under F the FATF to follow their rules, because otherwise you effectively get blacklisted out of the global trading system. Um, so the travel rule has come down to regulate uh, transactions in between crypto exchanges. And it's it, one of the problems with it is that it effectively was using analog rules to apply to digitized systems. So there hasn't what they want, as we touched on earlier, is the ability for before a transaction happens between two parties, that identity is shared. Now, there actually is no formal infrastructure to support that right now. And so that was the big problem is that you have 10,000 VASPs and no decentralized way to mm. or system or structure to support discovery of who your counterparty is or the transmission of data. You know, there's a lot of different companies that have come out there and created what we what we think is effectively centralized systems but a centralized system number one doesn't support what some of the foundational pillars of the crypto industry and number two can't effectively reach the 10,000 virtual asset service providers that are out there right now and as more service providers come on board um, it's totally the antithesis of what this crypto ecosystem is about, which is open and decentralized. So, so shift was made to solve. So one of the use cases for shift is we solve for that um, using our open infrastructure. So that's pretty interesting and kind of a big statement. What, like how, I guess. Okay. So okay, let, let, let's use a, let's use a, um, a bit of a, what's it called? An example, right? So, so for example, um, okay, so let's see, before we even get into the example, so FATF, they're like these global regulators. I have questions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm not the regulation queen, Our, as you know, Joe. Right, 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 right. The regulation guru, master, but yeah. Do you, do you, but Sue, I have a question. Do you know who these people, because I've, I've, I mean, for the record, I have been to the OECD um, and whatnot with Joseph. I think last year we were there together, but, but FATF, like, we, you know, this travel rule that's coming into the Bitcoin space and a lot of people are talking about it and rightfully so. And then I even bring it up quite often. I'm like, why aren't more people talking about this? Like, this is, you know what I mean? Like it's a big deal and, uh, and people should be more cognizant of the fact that it's, it's that there are conversations that are happening that might or might not affect them in the future. And so, so do you have any idea around, like just the word global regulator to me is a little bit of an oxymoron because mostly like, it's, like mostly regulators apply to like countries, right? Or like cities. And like, you think about police yeah. down the street. When you think of a global regulator, you're thinking like, my first question is, is who elected these people? Yeah. So <laughs> that's actually a good question. And my, my and how are they coming up with rules that affect you and me? <laughs> you know what I mean? Totally. totally. <laughs> Sorry. I got to yeah, ask. <laughs> what, what flies in Canada isn't exactly going to fly in Iran or, you know, what, what Brazil wants isn't always what China wants. And exactly. So, so my understanding, and again, don't quote me on this, but is, is that it is made up of multiple financial services regulators from all over the world and that they meet I think it's by quarterly or biannually to to basically discuss legislation and create these these frameworks for governing um got you virtual asset service providers um so so and it's interesting because shift has also set up their own sort of global governance committee to to lobby for effective and thoughtful regulation with respect to the travel mm -hmm. rule um and we actually have two members from the FATF on board, our governance committee. Uh, hmm. So we're, we're doing our best to work hand in hand with them to, to, again, push and create thoughtful regulation for the space, not regulation that would hinder innovation or potentially result in, you know, infrastructure that just is not conducive to, to really what open and decentralized means in the space. So, okay, so let, 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 let's, I, I'm sorry, and I'm, by the way, if I'm being like too, if I'm staying on a point too long, just let me know if it's like uncomfortably long here, no. but, but I think, I think these are really like big questions that, you know, yeah. I think I definitely had, have others I'm sure will have. Right. And, and I think it's really one of those like topics that almost everybody should be thinking about talking about opining on right and yet almost like crickets right like all you hear about yeah. all-time high and ngu and all this number go up right but um but 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 but, but okay so um 
Uh, okay, so there's let, let's just okay, let's just assume that okay, there we, we, there are these regulators, there are these um, global regulators. They have uh, they've been around for a long time. From my understanding, I think it stems from like when the World War, when World War One or World War Two happened, and like OECD and a lot of these elements kind of came together to rebuild and a like lot of new that world order. Yeah, yeah, to some extent, and and so you know, and I think and, and I think it's such an interesting time, right? Because like like things are being reimagined, if you will, right? I mean, I don't know if you fall if you're following Simon. Um, do you know you know Simon like Bank to the Future Simon? Simon, yes. yeah, so he's doing a lot of reporting on um, what's this new thing called? Uh, you know the Bretton Woods? Yeah. So they're, they're like supposedly proposing like a new kind of like, I don't know, thinking of the Bretton Woods agreement. And I don't even know what the date is, but Simon's been talking a lot about it. And and, and yeah. I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that it seems like there's a lot of changes happening, you know, in the world. And um, one of my goals for doing this like thing, and I mean, I know only like my mom's going to probably watch this, right? And maybe my wife, if I'm, if I'm lucky, but, <laughs> but, but my goal is to kind of go to get out there and have it so that more people know about what's going on. It's not just like the people who are building these companies and in these networks that yeah. are like, you know, that have this, like, it's like, nah, like everybody should be part of these. So, okay. So let me back up here. So I guess, okay. So we, we kind of, um, so, so there are regulations that work globally. Banks need to be able to, and there is something called a travel rule. So let's maybe explain that too. So that's not something that's coming up for crypto. That was something that's been around for a long time, right? And what does that even mean? Like, you know, again, the average person has no clue what, what yeah. some of this stuff means, right? So I'm just curious, what, what is a travel rule? And, and then I guess, how does that ap apply now to, you know, the crypto businesses? Yeah, so the travel rule effectively says before any money is exchanged between two different parties in the exchange, both traditional or crypto space, there has to first be a counterparty identity exchange as well. So that, you know, as the incoming recipient of the coin and the outgoing money, you know who you're getting your coin from and subsequently where that money is going. And obviously, you know, the real foundations is that it's trying to solve for, you know, anti-money laundering or any sort of you know, black market activity um, so that there is a, a record of, of who was transacting and why and when. So, but, but again, the problem with how they're, they're trying to put these rules that again, apply and function in analog systems, but they don't scale for digitized systems. So, so as an end user, if I'm sending or you know selling coin off of coin square and wanting to do a trade onto binance or or whatnot there they have to exchange my identity information first but i don't know what what rules are in place for binance singapore with respect to my identity i don't know how they're going to custody it there's no there's no sort of clarity or again if i go in an otc desk um and potentially you know do a trade through Nigeria. Like I, I have no, I have no sense as an end user as to what happens to my identity after it's been exchanged. So, so that's sort of some, you know, something that we think is, is a big problem, but, but how our infrastructure is designed is it solves for that. So again, we've got an attestation framework highway. We've got a way for counterparty discovery without actually having to transfer hard data. Um, and there's also an attestation revocation functionality built in. So it's basically the right to be forgotten um, uh, using our blockchain. So, okay, can you, can you please describe a little bit about the counterparty discovery layer? And, and I mean, I, again, I'm not asking about like, you know, like down to the nitty gritty, but just generally yeah. speaking how that happens, because I think that is super clever and uh, I don't know, worth mentioning. <laughs> yeah. So. So for example, if I'm a Binance and I have, um, you know, a trade coming in from another exchange for a substantial amount, or even someone who wants to, to now transact on my platform instead of using, you know, a clunky legacy other platform, um, there prior, previously, there's been no way for an exchange to effectively do any, any counterparty discovery. So there's no way for an exchange before accepting anything to be able to actually sort of do a search as to, hey, does anyone know who this person is? Has anyone transacted with this person before? Um, and so that's that's really where 
the blockchain comes in. Um, and we've also partnered with other partners like TRM Labs and Elliptic and Chainalysis to add an extra layer of due diligence. So again, when, when the entity is making that call to the network, pinging the network, we're basically saying, hey, does anyone know who this person is? You have that extra layer of, of parties who can provide you information so that as an exchange, you know that you're not you know, facilitating money laundering, you're not facilitating some sort of transaction from the dark web. But also as a consumer, I know that you know, my identity is not just flying around, being held in different silos and potentially insecure um, at exchanges all over the world. Um, yeah, if that if that makes any sense. And, and the and the counterparty discovery layer essentially happens with the hash or something, right? Like it's not like you don't actually do it with the data itself, right? It's not like you're. Um, so I'm just curious, like I mean that that seems really interesting, no? Like in terms of how, you know, what I'm saying, um, like for example, you know how in Bitcoin they have like they have like a hash of a function and yes. have like a, it, it'll be like some alphanumeric like um, character set and, and that will represent something else. And, and I think you yeah. guys are using that as well, right? As like a way, and, and that in it, and it, the reason I think it's interesting is because in that lies the ability to essentially use math to address the concerns of the regulators and the counterparties like the VASPs, but do it in a way that is like sovereign, um, Correct. Like that is like identity preserving or like, you know, sovereignty preserving. And it's like just being shared with the people, just the amount of information that you need to, instead of just like, oh, here's like everything, you know what Correct. I mean? Sending that all over the network. So I thought that was really interesting as well. So I guess what I'm saying is that if you recognize that, you know, identity is needed in the world we live in, how would you engineer it using what we know about Bitcoin and blockchain and Ethereum? And, you know, how would you engineer it in a way that, you know, that it meets the requirements, but does it in a, also like in a freedom preserving way? I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it definitely makes sense. But I think that that's where the strength of the fact that it's the smart contract infrastructure and like this new web three of, of, of sort of library there's, there's so much customizability, but still open and auditable frameworks that can be leveraged to, I think, well, we think meet the needs of regulators, but also preserve the privacy of the end user and also optimize the way that, that counterparties share information and discover one another. So I, I read a, um, like, I think it was a tweet thread yesterday. I don't even know who it was by, but somebody, and they were just like, talking about their experience on Uniswap and they were just like yeah you know people complain about like how it's a little bit harder to use but they were like 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 look at how many steps it took me to get my deal done on Uniswap here versus like on a centralized exchange with the mm -hmm. QIC and the CAPTCHA and the 2FA and the this and the that and the email and the blah 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 and it's like um you know what I mean? So the decent, so I guess where I'm going with this next question is, is <laughs> so like the decentralized exchanges aren't just like theory anymore. They're like kind of, I know. Here. and so yeah. how does that dovetail into this like weird and wanky, you know what I mean? This like, like that's what I, you have, like you have banks, you have centralized exchanges, and then you have now like DEXs, if you will. Yeah. Um, so just curious, how, like, does shift play a, like a role in all these worlds or is so, it more so or less so one, on the DeFi side? No, so, so that's sort of our next killer use case, killer app that we are working on compliant liquidity pools for the DeFi space. So basically a liquidity pool where anyone who transacts with that liquidity pool can know in the attestation framework that let's say these are finance identified parties or these are you know shift identified chain analysis audited parties from you know south korea so 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 that's actually the next use case that we're working on because it is very very interesting and personally i love the idea of what this does in terms of you know marginalized populations being able to earn income yield farm um using this decentralized uh you know, using these exchanges in the DeFi space. Um, so I think it's so, so really what, cool. Just curious, does it, what does that look like? Does that mean like they come to, let's say, a Coinbase or let's say a Binance or UnoCoin? 
they go through their whatever their KYC process, but now because they've gone through that initial process, they're now able to leverage that verification, if you will, but yes. not have to share it again with, Correct. let's say, a Uniswap, but but partake in. But like, why would they even want to? Because they can partake in Uniswap today, right? So why or whatever it is, right? Why why would they want to even like? partake in a what did you say a compliant kyc a pool. compliant liquidity pool yeah because i mean maybe well, explain to like how there is a world of like you know like hedge funds and like big like see raul paul and all these guys right michael saylor recently they've been like oh, i don't know advocating more for like governments and us to play nice and and that's been kind of a, a like a thread right like a discussion yeah. topic right people are like like nah like we're okay thank you very much i know um, I <laughs> but 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 I think what people don't realize though is is that if PayPal wants to go up and buy a bunch of Bitcoin and do KYC up the kazoo, then they can do so. But that doesn't affect the guy who's like on his cold card wallet. Like it just it only helps you, and the, they're all limited and you know more demand. Right. So so I guess I guess maybe kind of help me and others understand like like these these pools that can be created that can be created by people who choose to you know, forgo their identity. And there is, you know, essentially a market for that, right? And what does that market look like? Yeah, for sure. Well, I think I think it's just the whole, we're just trying to address the fact that no one wants to be regulated out of existence. And obviously, you know, Bitcoin and, and a lot of the open infrastructure was designed to have no intermediary oversight. But but the fact of the matter is that regulators have become a lot more astute um, and, you know, the tax man has figured out, you know, ways to tax people on things. So particularly in the U.S., um, definitely in Asia, uh, they've already started finding people in Singapore. So I think I think it's just that, you know, the core fundamental Bitcoin OGs um, and some of the pillars of really what all of this inf- technology was built on. Yes isn't really about regulation or being, you know, or being controlled in any way, shape or form by regulators. But the reality is, as the system grows up, it is going to be subject to greater scrutiny from governments. And in order for us to continue to thrive and succeed, we do kind of have to play nice. Um, At least that's what we believe. At least that's what, you know, a lot of our our global, um, you know, partners believe and you know members of the FATF so so we're really just doing it because we want to see the innovation to continue and not be shut down or regulated out of existence um we want it to become more mainstream and in order for that to happen like you do have to sort of play nice with the regulators and and Mm. do what they want to a certain degree yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you agree with that or no? Like, what do you, how do you, what do you think? Well, well, okay. So the, the counter argument to that is, I think, what was it again? I, wow, I draw on Twitter way too often, but uh, somebody recently said how I think IBM was helping, you know, Germany make uh, some of their like identity tools near the end of World War II. So it's like, uh, really? some people, oh, so, I... so some people argue that you know maybe you you should uh, not help them at all, um, but I obviously don't agree with that because I you know I'm obviously a stakeholder at Paycase and at Shift. I'm also yeah. um, a founder of UnoCoin, and from day one we made the decision to take the route of doing KYC and whatnot. Mainly, mainly it wasn't even I mean regulatory is one, um, but it was more to prevent fraud on our system too. We wanted yeah. to make sure that we we dealt with people that we could identify and and know. And I do think the technology has come a long way since then. And that's why I was curious about you know how Shift interfaces with this like you know highly subversive world of like DEXs, right? Where and I think yeah. the answer is is that. We don't know, right? We don't know, I guess, like long-term how things will play out. Um, but for now, um, you know, but, you know, I, I don't know. I've also been hearing about, and again, it's on Twitter. It's like you hear it everywhere is, is that people are talking about how, you know, if this travel rule really extends, like I think actually Brian Armstrong tweeted about it um, a couple of days ago, right? Did, did you read this? What do you say oh, about the travel rule? And I think it was addressing a lot of these, like how, you know, the importance of keeping kind of a free and open internet because because the next logical, I mean, not logical, but really illogical step, but maybe logical step from regulators might be to ban 
the transfers from centralized exchanges to DEXs. Yeah. And, and again, you know, just to keep talking about pink elephants, like um, that is a potential reality, right? And so I think, you know, whether it's Brian Armstrong or, you know, um, these are, these are, or myself on a personal note, these are things that, that I think about. Now, I mean, there is a point, right? Like in the sense that like after I take my money out at the bank and I have my cash, um, no matter how much tracking and this and that, like there's just nothing that, you know, uh, the regulators and companies can do, right? Uh, yeah. To exercise control, if you will. And maybe it'll be such that in the digital world, it'll be such that, you know, there'll be, there'll always be this kind of world where it'll be out of the, the, the kind of the reach of regulators and banks yeah. um, using cryptography and whatnot. But, but there will also be this like other world where people are just, you know, okay with their identity being more widely used. It's a very totally. deep topic. I mean, I, I kind of didn't, I, I knew today's conversation wouldn't be like just like another um, like Bitcoin comedy type of uh, episode. Yeah. Uh, I was going to be a little heavier and, and I'm really trying to do my best to kind of think ahead and think about like the lens of, cause I have a lot of people in the Bitcoin space, right. That are like hardcore Bitcoiners that like, you know, that I um, kind of, you know, look up to and, and cater to and whatnot. And so yeah. I know that this topic of identity is one that is very, it's a slippery slope. And, and so, but, but I, but again, I also believe in talking about things. And so, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? If, if, uh, if your ideas are out there, others can opine and disagree or agree. And yeah, yeah at, the, at the end of the day, our, all of our goals are the same. I think the the most interesting part is just seeing who's, from the traditional financial services space. So who, you know, sort of my peers, you could say from my background, like the Druckenmiller, the Paul Tudor Jones, the Alliance Bernstein asset managers, they run 631 billion bucks have now all changed their tune on Bitcoin. All of them are not, are not going like all in dump all your assets, but you know, you have all these traditional pundits and managers and investors who are now saying this is fucked what's happening in the U S with the mm. money printing. Mm. Uh, I think traditionally since 1982, the rate of growth of the money supply in the U S has been something like 5.2%, but year to date we're at 20% of money growth. And so it's just so interesting, like the legitimacy that Bitcoin now has with some of these traditional managers as mm. an investable idea and hedge in this, you know, potentially future inflationary environment. Um, and that, that to me has been the most like exciting turn of events is that it's, it's a legitimate asset now. Researchers and analysts are actually changing their opinion. Guys in 2018 who were calling it shit coins are now saying, you know what, a 1% allocation in your portfolio is a reasonable amount. And I think that that's, that's, that's the coolest part of how Bitcoin has grown up. And, and uh, I don't really know why I went on this tangent, but I'm pretty excited about it. Oh, well, it, I mean, let's, well, I mean, we've been talking about kind of heavy and depressing things. So maybe it is time we talk about <laughs> yeah. some more exciting things. Um, but no, I, I do think, I agree with you. I, I think this institutional adoption thing, it's kind of been at the edges for some time and we'll see if it plays out. Right. But it does feel like it's more real this time around. I mean, well, I think the pandemic has accelerated it. Mm. Absolutely. So like, true. So true. <clears throat> like not only in terms of you see um, digitization plans for some companies that were initially five years were now accelerated and happened in five months. Um, but again, like just the amount of people that are saying like, there's no fucking alternative to this never ending, you know, pumping of money into the markets the equity premiums are completely screwed now the only other alternative is real estate bitcoin or gold um and it's just it's very very interesting to see you know the amount of people who have turned around and said okay this is legit this isn't just another fad i mean i think even i think even ray dalio last week came out and said I must be missing something because clearly there's there's a use case here, which is big for Ray Dalio because he was all like, nah, child porn, internet, dark web, it's all criminals. Like Ray Dalio is a brilliant man. He's made a ton of money, but he's he's been a big naysayer and even he's he's come around. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, that, that, that's been the coolest part to watch, like, you know, um, like the Ron Pauls and, all, you know, all these other people, I think yeah. recently, oh, Mr. Wonderful. You know, the Canadian billionaire, the bald guy, come on, Kevin O'Leary, 
Kevin. Oh, Ramirez. Kevin's on board. Pomp. Pomp. Oh. Pomp. I didn't. I haven't. I haven't. Pomp I haven't had some. Yet. I think he had him on his show like a few days ago. And and Mr. Wonderful. I think this morning I woke up and I read read that he's gonna allocate like five percent of his something something to an uh, ETF, a Bitcoin ETF. So they're all starting to come on board one by one. I, I find that that interesting. That you know we were only like eight years ahead of a lot of them. <laughs> um, but hey, you know it's all good in the hood. Um, uh, better late than never. And Bitcoin is one of those things where it's like. You know, you wake up, you're like, oh, Michael Saylor just bought $50 million. Like, great. Like, all the power to him. I hope 100 more companies do that, right? Because there's yes. only a limited number of Bitcoin. <laughs> so do you, do you think it is going to go to, like, what people are saying, like, 100, 100 grand a coin, 52 grand a coin? Like, what, in terms of your, where, like, where do you think it's going? Uh, I've kind of had, okay, so I've had a similar thesis. So I discovered Bitcoin, I think it was when it was less than $10. I think I have my my proof still of when I bought it, my first Bitcoin at like $14. And since oh then, God. I've been telling everybody I know that I think Bitcoin's going to a million dollars of Bitcoin. Yeah, I don't know if it's going to happen in like 10 years or 15 years or whatever, but um, I, I've always felt that like Bitcoin was going on a million bucks. Uh, so, so to answer your question, do I think it'll go to a hundred? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think, so I do. And I, and I'm very, very confident of that. Um, longer term, I think what I'm really bad at is trying to predict like short-term Bitcoin prices. And I think everybody is. And, and then the reason is, is because, <coughs> excuse me, I think the, um, like, you know, in thermodynamics, it's like if you're trying to like predict the position of an atom in a glass of water, it's almost impossible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if you want to predict the aggregate of like what all the atoms are going to do, it's much easier. Hey, I'm going to grab some water. I'm just going to pause it one second. Yeah. Okay, we're back. Okay, cool. Sorry, I just had to get some water. Um, So I, I think, yeah, but I think predicting it like long term is like I said, it's like trying to predict what the temperature of a glass of water will be like 10 minutes from now or an hour from now. It's yeah. actually not that hard. And um, like you said, with the kind of the macro economic situation where like governments are printing money, like the other day, my mom was, uh, my parents came to visit from, from Alberta and, you know, um, we were all talking and my mom was like, you know, like the government's giving everybody these like paychecks and, you know, like paying everybody. She, she was like, where does that money come from? And I was like, it, yeah. So I'm like, mom, like that, that, that question is the question I started asking 10 years ago. Like, that's why I'm in Bitcoin. And I think a lot of people are going to start asking that question. It's like, well, what is it to start with? And why are we all like running after these like pieces of paper and who makes it and how much of it is there? And, and so, 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 so sorry, but just to finish up my last point yeah. is I used to think that a million dollars was going to be the ceiling. I now think it'll be the floor. Yeah. <laughs> I think the way things are going, I think like 10 years from now, we'll be like, oh my God, could you imagine? Like we lived during a time when it was less than a million dollars. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, I agree. It's more, it's 100% possible. And just, just, in, you know, on the note of, you know, what your mom was saying and just talking about, you know, the never ending printing, it's something like 38% of the S&P in the mm -hmm. U.S. 38% of companies in the S&P 500 are actually zombie companies. So companies mm. that can't even service their own debts, but are getting these cash injections from the government, still a part of the S&P. Um, something like 80% of airlines that got bailouts actually use their cash reserves from mm -hmm. you know the past couple of years to just buy back their stock in the market. So instead of investing in innovation, investing in R&D that could potentially result in more jobs. These companies just spent their money on buying their stock back, juicing the stock prices and effectively making their CEOs and executives rich because their stock hit a certain price, they get their payout. It's insane. Like there is no more. I mean, Shamath Pelopatiya is like one of my favorite dudes of all time. You know who I'm talking about? Of course, I met him. You know, I'm, oh my God, really? Yeah, Where yeah, did you yeah, see yeah. him? In his office. <laughs> like you just walked in and he was no like, i pitched him <laughs> really yeah yeah yeah. i'm a big what fan i'm a big fan him? i've met a surprising number of like super cool people you'd be surprised like i've got to write a book someday like i met dr ron paul can you believe that 
my God. <laughs> yeah. You okay, absolutely need to write someday, this shit someday, down. Someday, someday, someday. Well, but continue, 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 continue. I'm sure you heard Shamath's rant on NBC basically saying like, we're no longer, like the US is no longer a capitalist state. It's like effectively cronyism. Like they're not letting mm. anyone fail. Like the pillar of capitalism is if you have poor governance, if you don't, you know, you don't have sound business practices, you fail. And then the good guys, it's like dark, it's Darwinism, right? There is, there's no more, there's, they're not letting people fail. And that is like a fundamental dysfunction of what's happening right now in the traditional public markets and inflating asset prices. And anyways, just to your point, I completely agree that there's, yeah. Hey, Sue, I'm kind of I'm kind of diving back into the deep end a bit here. But did you recently see the the finance minister's comments in Ontario about? I mean, it's it's going viral on Twitter right now with uh, oh my god, with like she she today. she recently made some comments around uh, pre stimulus. She said, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but she said something to the effect that um, essentially how the economists or the statisticians there they've done a lot of studies and we've realized that there are some really really wealthy families in canada that have a lot of you know i guess money or whatever they're applying yeah. and and you know and we're uh trying to figure out how to unlock that you know pre-stimulus <laughs> is what they're calling it and they're like you know obviously we want people to just unlock it themselves but if they don't, we are open to ideas on how to incentivize people. It's like, what? <laughs> yeah, um, a little. Yeah, exactly. And, and another thing that I don't think a lot of people know, do you know what a bail-in is? I actually don't. Do you know what a bailout is? Yes. That's Bitcoin course. started. So a bailout yeah. is you know, right where they go and they print money and they give it, right? They come, they come to the public or whatever. A bail-in is where the banks can take the money from the people that have the money there. <laughs> so imagine it's possible, man. So Cyprus, it's Cyprus. Possible. Remember Cyprus? Cyprus did it. Cyprus was that's a bail. Lebanon, in. Lebanon, so in Canada. Canada now. So in Canada, you, I I remember a few years ago. I'm sure someone could find it probably, but but there was some law passed where bail-ins were allowed. So I wonder if all this is essentially leading in that direction. So negative interest rates, bail-ins. I mean, what could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> it's so wild. So, so, so back to your Bitcoin thing, right? So I do, I, I agree with you. I, I think, I think that the, in my eyes, the most important and exciting thing about Bitcoin is that it is limited and deflationary and that it acts as a measuring stick for the rest of the world in terms of like governments and banks and money printing. And it just keeps people honest. And if people like myself are like, Hey, maybe the world's not, you know, super welcoming to freedom. Then, then they have an ejection seat, totally. they have a, an opt out. They have a way to, you know, there's scarcity. No one can just debase it. And it's mobile AF. That's what I love. Exactly. So, exactly. So yeah, it's 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 definitely interesting times we're living in, especially Canada. I don't know how Canada is going to pay anything back, seeing as like one third of our income is reliant on oil demand and oil demand is down. But didn't they go negative this year? <laughs> like, yeah. how the hell does that even happen? I, 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 I was born and raised in Alberta, so and my family lives there still. And so it definitely was a bit of a like, you know, cannot yeah. compute type of deal. Um Okay. Oh my God. This has already been like an hour and 15. So, okay. Uh, yeah. Let's keep moving on here. So we talked about your story. We talked about, you know, shift and, and kind of your, uh, you know, all of that, maybe a little bit too much, but okay. The, the, the third question is, and the third and kind of final big question is around what one truth do you hold that most other, let's say Bitcoiners would disagree with you on? Um, like hardcore Bitcoiners. I mean, usually we can, we, well, I prefer to, yeah, yeah, I prefer that because I'm calling the like, thing Bitcoin stories. So I, I want to kind of keep it around like, yeah, like, you know how Bitcoiners are and Bitcoin yeah. represents like what, 60, 70% of the market, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah. I mean, it's relevant. So let yeah. So w w is there any contrarian belief amongst them? I mean, identity in itself is probably yeah. one, but other than that, or maybe even that, I don't know, what would you want to? Okay. Honestly, I get mm. in arguments with with our founders all the time about this is I feel like a lot of hardcore Bitcoiners are like 
all in, it's Bitcoin, Bitcoin or nothing. I still believe, so I am a chartered investment manager, which means I am licensed to run money and I know all about portfolio management theory and whatnot, but I still think that yes, Bitcoin is the answer. I'm very bullish on it. I absolutely believe in it. Um, you know, the scarcity, the divisibility, it's mobile, it's sovereign, but um, there's still room for other asset classes in a portfolio, like gold. Gold is also scarce. It is not as mobile as Bitcoin, but there is scarcity. It is, you know, there, it is a hedge in an inflationary environment. So I am very bullish, I think, on other asset classes as a hedge that I think most traditional Bitcoiners would disagree with me on, particularly at my company. Like they never want to hear me talk about, you know, what's going on in the gold market or, you know, real estate. Um, so, yeah, I think that the alternatives to the U.S. dollar are, are few and far between, but that Bitcoin isn't the only one. That's probably that I would say that's the most unpopular opinion I have. And then I want to just touch on quickly. Um, mm. So one of the things I love about the Bitcoin core community, and I feel like traditional tech voices haven't caught on to yet, is how inclusive um, Bitcoin is. Like I, it's the first, I mean, I find that, you know, all of this women in tech, women need to be represented, this, that, and the other. The Bitcoin blockchain industry is the first experience I've ever had where it doesn't, I don't, I don't really feel like anyone gives a shit about like what gender you are. Everyone just cares about what your brain can build and like what different alternate universes you can play in and effectively potentially monetize. That's, that's been my experience. And that's one of the, one of the things I love the most about it, that no one sex, gender, that sort of thing is not, is like, I feel like it's very inclusive and that if you've got an idea, there's a forum for you to play in and someone who will listen to you. So well, I love that as like a, yeah, as like a, as like a, well, it's not parting message yet, but uh, you know, close to the end here, that that's a great one. Cause yeah. Cause I do hear a lot about like, Oh, you know, whether it's like someone throwing a conference being like, they don't have enough women, you know, speakers and this Talk and that. women that I, I, that kind of irks me a bit. It's like, um, but I don't know what about it. Is it like the fact that there aren't, or that just, I don't know. It's like, but it just is what it is. Um, I found that a lot of the people I'm interviewing are women just because because a lot of people I know that are doing great things are women. So it just okay. happens that way. But I'm not like, okay, I got to make sure I have like one woman for every one man on every show. Right? It's just like, I'm I just trying I to- I don't agree with that at all. And I think the community and the way it's built and even the technology itself is that anyone can go in and fuck around on GitHub and build something and put it up there for everyone to see. And especially again, like no one cares, well, at least, you know, the interactions I've had, no one cares if you're trans, doesn't fucking matter because what matters is your brain and what are you producing? How are you making the world a better place? And I think it is incredibly inclusive. And so I get a bit frustrated when I hear women, you know, you know, I get a lot of calls, like we're doing a women only panel and this, that, and the other. And I, I agree that those initiatives have to happen, but I think Bitcoin's a lot more inclusive than the traditional tech industry realizes. Um, and yeah, yeah. so that, that's and, one of the things I love about it. And here's my thing is, is that like, do you, uh, maybe, maybe there are, but like, are there like, like men's blockchain dinners? I have no idea. Like, wouldn't that be super weird? No, I'm just saying like, imagine if no, I was I like, agree. I was like, guys, I'm, I'm, uh, where are you going tonight? I'm going, I'm going to the man's blockchain dinner. Right. I mean, maybe not, maybe not, but I'm just saying it sounds a little funny. I mean, I've done like men's like retreats and stuff. Like there, there yeah. is a place for that. I get totally. it. Or like, you know, anyways, but, but I, 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 I'm kind of, uh, I mean, I'd, yeah, like, a, or a men's, like a men's, you know, uh, uh, forum or a men's, um, you know, state <laughs> panel of like Bitcoiners. It's like, yeah. I would never do that. So I would, so conversely, I would never do like a woman's panel. Totally. <laughs> like, and and look at the technology itself. It's open source. Anyone can get on and code. This isn't yeah. like you have to be born in Silicon Valley and have graduated from Princeton to participate. Mm fucking ecosystem and so that's one of the things i love most about this industry and yeah less talking about 
fucking what your gender or sex is and just more putting your ideas out there and making them fucking mm. happen and i think that this is the one forum where you really can't do that yeah and you know, on a personal note i don't know coin and you know uh-huh. like all of our like smartest engineers and a lot of our like employees are are, are women <laughs> you know right? and so yeah 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 uh and there are any you know I, I studied engineering and like in my engineering classes it was always like 99 dudes for every one girl um, yeah. But in India, it's different. It's like there's a surprising number of like women in engineering as well. It's like, it's like a, there's so many. Of them. Okay, uh, a question for you. Um, right. Uh, anything that you wish I'd asked that I didn't ask? <laughs> um, no, because I got to get my like last little like okay inclusive pitch in there. That's that's sort of the one thing all of the podcasts yeah. that I do. I like being like, no, fuck that. Women have a have a place at this table that we don't have to fight for. That's that's I'm going to fight for. I like that. Like, cause I, yeah, yeah, it's a little bit yeah, it's hard to hear the other one, but I, I agree. I think I think it is very inclusive, and I have two little daughters, so I oh, definitely amazing. want them, you know, growing up thinking that they can make a difference in Bitcoin. I like yeah. to think they already are, but uh, anyways, I used to take me up on like, when I used to do my big events. I used to take me up on stage all the time just to do oh, like introductions yeah. and stuff, you know, just just cause. Um, okay, uh, yeah, right, right. Oh, you know, on that on that point around um, kind of like contrarian belief amongst Bitcoiners, I kind of missed one. So, do you also have another one that applies to outside of Bitcoin? So like not anything to do with Bitcoin or crypto or Ethereum or blockchain. Like, do you have any contrarian belief like today as the world stands that you think everyone believes and you're kind of like on the other side of the fence on and you're like, oh my God, like people just don't get it. Uh, Yeah. I mean, I don't even know if this is contrarian. I'm sure there's lots of people who think like me on this, but for probably most of invest actually no i'd say a lot of investors in the traditional financial services space still think that the u.s is the fucking number one place to be the number one place to invest like no matter what the u.s will come out on top and i feel like a lot of people aren't fucking looking at what china's doing and how you know they they've just signed this well first of all they're making serious gains with the digital yuan right so so being able to trade using the digital yuan instead of the us dollar for some of the trade packs that they've started in, in asia is a big fucking deal the fact that they're going they've got their one belt one road initiative and they're getting all parties so that's like pakistan i think it's iran or iran who's part of this as well will all be trading with the digital yuan and i feel like a lot of people aren't talking about the things china's doing to to potentially overtake the US and really take control potentially of the world like I I mean I think there are a lot of people who would agree with me on that but probably a lot of also traditional investors who think the US will always be number one and can is that I have a question is that worrisome at all like considering that China is a communist country and all I mean it it, I don't know if I'd say it's worrisome but the balance of power is could be very worrisome if our main trading partner is no longer the most powerful country in the world and we have to really reestablish trade ties that could not be great for Canada for sure Mm. um I don't know if I'd say it's worrisome I definitely would say it's something to fucking look at though people Mm. like Mm. so yeah the global the global kind of um balance of power balance is definitely is definitely shifting and it's changing and so yeah definitely and I think yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, maybe I think I'm, uh, anyways, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, next question, real quick here. So I think we got a few minutes left. You still got, you still got five minutes for me or? Yeah, you have to yeah, go? yeah, totally. Okay, um, any thoughts on AI? Have you thought about it at all? Or are you yeah, more the sidelines? Yeah. Or have you read, yeah, or I don't know. AI is really interesting. Um, in particular, I'm really interested in how AI bots are trained right? Because the AI is only as smart as the inputs that were used to train Mm. the AI algorithm, or I'm probably saying that incorrectly. Um, So for example, I know that AI and some of the smart car technology, about a year ago, researchers had forgot to train it or neglected to train it to identify like certain light skinned people. Mm. And so so it actually, so the car couldn't identify like a light skinned pedestrian. and And in fact, identify them as like a tree big problem obviously so 
so yeah, I, I think AI is very interesting, but um, yeah. I, I what about, uh, have you also thought about Ubi? Universal basic income. I mean, it's kind of a thing now, I guess, but like yeah. any thoughts on it just in general? It's just one of those things I like bringing up because it, it triggers people <laughs> either yeah, for good I or mean, bad. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say I've put too, too much thought into it, but I think that anything that would give people some foundation so that they could deploy their own resources to more productivity instead of like, how am I going to get water? How am I going to get food to, okay, that's been taken care of. And now how am I going to make that business idea happen or whatnot? Mm. I think it's a fucking beautiful thing. Mm. Um, but no, I'm curious why, what, what are your thoughts on the UBI? Like what are your, Oh, it's like, it's one of those, like, I think like things like AI and Ubi are like double-edged swords, but it's like, like as a Bitcoiner, obviously everyone's against like taking money from a certain group of people and giving it to others like through force. So I'm not I'm not really for the whole kind of government mandated Ubi where we print to oblivion. Well, now with Bitcoin in existence, they can do whatever they want, right? Like they can, if they yeah. want to do it, fine, do it. Um, but still, I'm not a huge fan of that. I, I, I think, I mean, I kind of have this like vision maybe. It could be like, a nightmare as well i'm not really sure um but i had this like vision of maybe like a free market based approach towards addressing you know like people not being able to like you said have water and like you know yeah. food and like the mean like it, it kind of irks me that i go to bed every night and i'm super like cozy in my bed and, like i've got a full yeah. tummy and I've seen my own eyes so much poverty, like billions and billions of people in the world literally don't even yeah. have like electricity or running water or food. And I'm supposed to just be like, eh. <laughs> uh, so I, I do try and think of like how to address that at scale. And, you know, and sometimes we just are biased and we look at the world through the lens through which, you know, we know. So, so yeah. to me, it's like, I try and think a lot about like, Hey, I wonder if, you know, I wonder if, and then, sorry, just to keep going on that is like, like AI too. Like if you for, fast forward that revolution to the future, like it's foreseeable that we could create a lot of prosperity and um, abundance on earth, like from a, mm -hmm. from like a robotics and solar energy and this and that. Yeah, yeah. So why are we not embracing that future and like putting humanity on the path towards like perpetual vacation as mm -hmm. opposed to like perpetual stress and you but, know, would mm. perpetual vac vacation be a good thing? Like not like existing <sighs> in a world where you don't like friction and tension actually does produce usually drivers of change and momentum and, and drive, right? Like it's that little bit of discomfort that drives people to go to work every day, that drives people to, like, I, I don't know. I mean, I know maybe you're just sort of Ooh, like yeah, yeah. hyperbolic, but I don't mm. think like, taking the foot, like the foot off the pedal is the, like, I, I don't know. I just don't know if I would want a purely vacation type existence do you know what i mean if ai was solving for everything i think that it would almost like some fundamental parts of humanity would become um atrophied do you know what i mean so, so i should mention that like I, I hate vacations okay so in general okay. so i mean like don't get me wrong um like i hate vacations as in like i get so bored on them and like i'm just, no, yeah, you to were get just being hyperbolic yeah, but yeah i think i think putting people or humanity in a position where they don't necessarily like if they don't work, they don't eat. I think it's a bit um, potentially inhumane. And by the way, I'm not talking about like, how do we put millions of dollars in the hands of everybody? I'm talking about like most people that are dying, if you put $5 into their hands, like a day, which I would argue probably wouldn't like break the bank for humanity. Um, you could probably have them like literally just like survive, you know, like have like, Bread. and become productive <laughs> members of society and and, and it give them the potential yeah. yeah and yeah. and i mean like and for me to be like well they just need to work a little bit harder is a little bit unfair because i didn't have it all like i i mean i i i my parents gave me tons of shit like i got whatever i wanted yeah so yeah why is it that there are people in this world that don't have anything and if i isn't it my duty to like provide for my family and my kids obviously 
but to also maybe think systemically about like how humanity can address totally like you know AI and like robotics and all these things are amazing. Bitcoin is amazing, but like what if it could be amazing for everyone and like all of us? And again, like I don't like the I don't like the idea of using force um of like mm-hmm. you know of like us using guns to be like you rich guy over there hand it over buddy. But I do like the idea of technologists, philanthropists, entrepreneurs, you know, people coming together and like brainstorming ideas of like how to build a new society. And I do think that, you know, AI kind of thrives on data. And a lot of that data, identity data, resides in the walls of maybe five companies and two governments, China, United yeah. States, Google, Facebook, whatever, whatever. And the fact that shift is moving towards democratizing identity and making it such that I control my identity and I get to share it with Binance or whatever counterparty that I want um, instead of the other way around, I think is pretty exciting. Uh, yeah. Anyways, Sue, so this has been like, ah, like 90 minutes of, uh, of, of, you know, it's been like really intense. So I wanted to thank you a lot for, uh, for taking the time to, you know, yeah, thank you so much. So yeah, um, anything in, okay, so where do people learn more about, you know, Shift, uh, yourself, like Twitter, I don't know, do you maintain a medium? Yeah. Where, where do you, where do people learn more about you? I would say you can find me on LinkedIn. That's probably my main platform LinkedIn? where I okay. post and engage Suzanne Ennis on LinkedIn okay. and then Shift, yeah, Shift.network. Um, we're all over Telegram, Twitter, definitely give us a follow and yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Okay. So with that, I'm going to bring this to a close. Okay. Thank you.